Here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Doctors across the country are slamming former Republican Senator Rick Santorum for arguing that young people protesting for gun control would be better served by learning CPR. How about kids, instead of looking to someone else to solve their problem, do something about maybe taking CPR classes? That was former Pennsylvania Senator Rick Santorum speaking on CNN Sunday. He accepted thousands of dollars from the NRA during his time in office. In 2011, during his failed presidential bid, he staged a photo op wearing an orange NRA hat and hunting pheasants with a shotgun. Medical professionals roundly refuted Santorum's suggestion that CPR could help save the life of someone shot by a military-style assault rifle. Among them, our guest, Dr. Eugene Gu of Vanderbilt University of Medical Center, who tweeted, quote, "'As a surgeon, I've operated on gunshot victims who've had bullets tear through their intestines, cut through their spinal cord and pulverize their kidneys and liver. Rick Santorum telling kids to shut up and take CPR classes is simply unconscionable, Dr. Gu tweeted. Well, for more, we continue our conversation with Dr. Gu, who's joining us today from Los Angeles, so he works in Nashville. Dr. Gu, can you respond to Senator, former Senator Rick Santorum? Yes, and thank you so much, Amy, for having me on your show. Um, I think Senator, former Senator Santorum's comments were very reminiscent of, you know, the Queen of France, Marie Antoinette, when she said to the starving peasants, let them eat cake. It was just simply unconscionable. First of all, CPR isn't um, necessarily helpful for victims of penetrating trauma. Oftentimes, there's a bleeding around the heart. We call that cardiac tamponade. Or uh, there's a collapsed lung, a tension pneumothorax that be, could be causing a cardiac arrest. Uh, and doing chest compressions is, you know, just counterproductive at that point. Many of these patients are bleeding, and th that's a source of why they're in such distress, and doing CPR is just not going to help them. Um, but his comments just really reminded me of a patient that came into the hospital uh, when I was on call. Uh, there was a man who had multiple gunshot wounds to his abdomen, and when he came into the trauma bay, he was crashing. His blood pressure was very low. His heart rate was through the roof. Um, he didn't—we didn't even have enough time to get a CT scan and see what's going on. We rushed him immediately to the operating room as a level 1 trauma. Um, and as we opened up his abdomen, you know, there was this immediate rush of blood that just fell onto the floor. Uh, we packed all four quadrants of his abdomen uh, to temporarily stop the bleeding. And when we examined each quadrant, um, I saw that uh, his liver— there was a large laceration on the right side of his liver that was causing a lot of the bleeding, as well as his right kidney was completely shattered. Uh, so we had to spend a lot of time removing his entire kidney, uh, repairing, taking out that section of the liver that was damaged. Um, and then we turned our attention to uh, the abdomen, where there was uh, a bunch of stool and feces just contaminating the whole area, because the bullets had just ripped through his small intestine and his large intestine. We had to remove a large amount of bowels. Um, and create an ostomy. An ostomy is essentially a, a bag that contains the, the fecal material on the outside of the abdomen. Um, and uh, we sent, after we spent many hours in the operating room doing the best we can to repair all his injuries, we sent him to the intensive care unit, you know, intubated and sedated. Uh, he was clinging on to life for about a week, and then he finally, uh, unfortunately, passed away. And he was only 20 years old. And when I hear Rick Santorum telling these kids who are marching, literally marching for their lives, protesting against the gun violence that happens, you know, in their very schools, uh, when he just tells them, don't do that, you know, let's just, why don't you learn CPR instead, it outrages me, it outrages many other medical professionals as well. Um, and it's, like I said, it's a simply unconscionable comment to make. You know, these politicians are already not doing anything to help these children, but they're, they are going out of their way to tell these children not to protest. I also wanted to ask you, Dr. Gu, about what's happening at the Department of Veterans Affairs. On Wednesday, President Trump fired Secretary of Veterans Affairs Dr. David Shulkin, said he'd replace him with his White House physician, Dr. Ronnie Jackson, a rear admiral in the Navy. Dr. Jackson has no experience running a large agency. This is the second largest in government, $200 billion agency. Dr. Shulkin says he was ousted because of his op opposition to privatizing the VA, which runs 1,700 hospitals and clinics. So this is President Trump at a rally in Ohio on Thursday. I had passed 
the VA accountable, the accountable, the Accountability Act. And now when they're bad to our vets or when they're not working for our vets, we say, hey, Jim, you fired. Get out of here, Jim. Get out. Um, we can only imagine he's just getting da Dr. David Shulkin's name wrong as he talks about Jim. But, uh, Dr. Eugene Gu, you've worked at the local VA in Nashville as a resident physician for the last two and a half years. Your thoughts? Yeah, I think uh, a lot of this is a consequence of what it means to have elected um, a reality TV show guy who's not qualified to be president, who's now hiring all these people who are not qualified to be, you know, the secretary of education like Betsy DeVos or now the secretary of the VA, Ronnie Jackson. You know, earlier he had even tried to appoint his personal pilot to be, you know, head of the FAA. And Ronnie Jackson, who has absolutely no experience running a large federal agency, I think, you know, earlier in your segment you talked about uh, you and Suzanne talked about how the VA is the second largest federal agency with a $200 billion budget. And Ronnie Jackson has no experience running that. You know, as a resident who has worked at the VA, um, I know the benefits of having a single provider, nationally integrated system in which to care for all of our veterans. Uh, you know, when we have a veteran coming from Miami to Nashville, I can pull up all of his records because there's a standardized medical record system called CPRS, where we can take a look at all of the veterans' imaging, all of the veterans' medical records. We don't have to call another hospital and figure out what procedures he had done. And it's very, very convenient and effective for us. If the uh, veteran—you know, these veterans have very specific injuries. You know, oftentimes we can have a young 20-year-old veteran who has hearing loss that you wouldn't expect to see in a 20-year-old because of all the, you know, loud gunshots that he's been uh, having to hear. And, uh, you know, we can consult an audiologist. We can, we can have an ENT physician see him. You know, it, having an integrated system is extremely important and cost-efficient for these veterans. Um, so, sometimes, you know, I've seen— there's a there's been a hybrid push to have to see what uh, privatization looks like uh, by having a VA choice system. This choice system is where uh, if a veteran uh, can't get the care he needs at our VA uh, within 30 days, he can be choiced out or sent to a another private hospital within the community. Now, what, what I've seen with that choice system is that it actually degrades the level of care we have at our VA. For example, um, at the Nashville VA, the sterilizers were broken for quite some time. The sterilizers we used to autoclave and sterilize the surgical instruments. So the operating rooms were actually at very limited capacity because we didn't have clean surgical tools to operate on our veterans, which is a travesty. But because of this uh, quote unquote choice system, mm -hmm. which allows us to send veterans to other hospitals, it was almost like a crutch that we used to say, okay, we don't have to really have that much of an impetus to fix these broken sterilizers that are not cleaning the surgical tools we need. We can just choice these veterans out to other local private hospitals, and they can still get their surgeries. Well, I had one patient come in in the middle of the night, you know, who needed emergency, emergency surgery. But because our sterilizers weren't working, we didn't have clean tools to operate on him, we had to, you know, choice him out or send him, uh, you know, to another hospital. And, I, and you know, that delayed his care. And I think that that's just one example of what can happen with privatization of the VA. You know, another example is um, it, we saw the horrible response to the disaster relief uh, in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria, when, they, when <laughs> FEMA tried to privatize disaster relief. You know, they, they gave a $156 million contract to a one-woman, uh, you know, uh, company. Uh, I, think, I believe his name was Tiffany Brown. Uh, and she was contracted to provide 30 million meals to these starving Puerto Ricans who just suffered this major disaster. And, you know, it turned out that she only provided 50,000 meals out of, uh, out of the 30 million that she was contracted to provide. So they, they, they paid all this money uh, to this lady who then just pocketed the money for herself. And Dr. I think Gu, that. I wanted yeah. to ask you um, about another issue. You're one of seven Twitter users who has filed a lawsuit against President Trump after being blocked from Trump's personal account. The case is titled Knight First Amendment Institute versus Trump. Very quickly, can you talk about what this is about? Yeah, definitely. So uh, one day I tweeted to Trump after he, he made a tweet about how he was doing so well in the Rasmussen poll. And uh, I tweeted to him because recently he, he made, at that time, he made a comment about uh, uh, a typo called Kafifi. Um, 
which many people didn't know what that was. And so I wrote, in, in response, Kafifi, the man who controls uh, our country's nuclear codes, doesn't proofread his Twitter account. Uh, he blocked me for that. And I think that, you know, the president of the United States uses his personal Twitter account, you know, to make actual national policy announcements. And, and, and um, for instance, he fired Secretary of State Rex Tillerson uh, through his Twitter account. He fired uh, the, the secretary of the VA, David Shulkin, through his Twitter account. These are very. This is a very important information for me as an American citizen to see. And so it's not necessarily his personal Twitter account anymore if he is using it in his capacity as a president of the United States uh, to announce major policy changes and personnel changes. Finally, we just have 30 seconds, Dr. Gu, but um, you tweeted a photo of yourself taking a knee and raising a fist with the caption, I'm an Asian-American doctor, and today I take the knee to fight white supremacy. Uh, Dr. Gu, you were placed on paid administrative leave after the mother of one of your patients complained about that photo. Very quickly, your response. Yeah, so um, I took the need to fight white supremacy because when I was an intern general surgery resident at Vanderbilt, I was racially and physically attacked in the parking garage uh, by a white supremacist. You know, he stalked me all the way up nine uh, flights of stairs at the hospital, uh, grabbed me by my name badge, nearly choking me. And so when I saw the NFL players like uh, Colin Kaepernick and Michael Bennett taking the knee to fight police brutality and white supremacy, it, it resonated very much with me. And so wearing the same hospital white coat and scrubs that I had worn the day that I was racially and physically attacked, I took the knee to fight against the, the very racism that I was the victim of. Um, it was a very personal thing for me to be attacked like that, and so I wanted to do a peaceful protest uh, to fight what happened to me, and well, uh, I was punished for it. I want to thank you so much for being with us, Dr. Eugene Gu, general surgery resident, Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville, Tennessee, health care columnist for The Hill. Dr. Gu's also worked at the local VA in Nashville as a resident physician for the last two and a half years. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, Stephen Hawking's funeral is tomorrow in Britain. We'll remember this remarkable, groundbreaking scientist. Stay with us.